Um, I'd first like to thank all of you for coming out on what is not a terribly Aprilish day. Um, as I drove in from Kingston this, this afternoon, I, I have a brother who lives up in Newmarket, which is where I was coming. I left Kingston and it was only two. I came to Toronto and thought I was bombing. I mean, it was about six as I drove, to, it went up the 404, according to my car. Got to Newmarket and it was down to three. And when I came down tonight, I went, oh, not nice. Um, and so you can imagine, I mean, it's interesting, though, I do want you to think that this is the kind of weather that some of the folks who I'm going to be talking about uh, were trying to cope with during the war. But before I get to the war itself, I, the, the title that I've, um, I, I, we, we chose, in fact, and it was Gary's idea as much as mine, is loyal they remained, but with a question mark. And I want to talk about that question mark more than anything else. And so here we go. Come all ye bold Canadians, I'll have you lend an ear unto a sure ditty which will your spirits cheer. Concerning an engagement we had at Detroit town, the pride of those Yankee boys we so bravely we took down. Now that's the opening stanza of a Canadian ballad that was apparently composed shortly after the outbreak of hostilities in the fall of 1812. The story, the song itself, tells the story of a glorious Canadian victory at Detroit when, quote, our brave commander, Sir Isaac Brock, led a handful of eager, undaunted Canadian boys to the western part of the colony of Upper Canada and forced the Yankees to surrender. Like many others of its kind, the ballad extolled the glorious victory of a heroic and patriotic people. But when Stephen Miles, who was the editor of the Kingston Gazette, reported earlier than the battle in Detroit, in fact, in about mid-June of 1812, that, quote, it is pretty clearly ascertained that war with the United States is no longer to be avoided, he and many of his readers were clearly upset by the news. Miles did call, and for a colonial paper, it's actually quite a lengthy article. It runs almost a full column, and for those of you who read, have looked at some of these papers, that's a lot of, a lot of press. Uh, at the end of that, he did call on, quote, every loyal subject and friend of his king and country to heed the dying, sorry, admonition of the lamented and immortal Nelson. England expects every man will do his duty, and that was in caps. Uh, and he sort of, that's how he ends the article. But he and many throughout the colony were dismayed and in fact very concerned about the prospects of the coming conflict. Upper Canadians did not want to go to war in 1812, and many did all they could to avoid becoming involved in the conflict. Certainly, there had been war scares for at least the last five years, and all had known, even in the spring of 1812, as one of the uh, newspapers in, here in York said, that war was at no great distance. Still, the news that came in June that war had been declared was unsettling and for many very frightening. Now traditionally, as all you know, uh, the War of 1812 has been characterized, even by our own government, as the first real test of the new peoples and of their earlier decision to remain loyal to the Empire and the British King during the first American Civil War, or what's colloquially called the American Revolution. In 1812, the story goes, Canadians, and particularly Upper Canadians, gallantly fought for their homes, their communities, and their king. They fought for peace and to preserve a, war, a way of life that was inherently more civilized than that of the enemy to the south. The Canadian victory, first at Detroit, and then, of course, of the war itself, both confirmed, the story goes, it's often told today, the justness of Upper Canadians' cause and illustrated that Upper Canadians were indeed bold Canadian boys and willing and eager combatants who remained truly true to their loyalist heritage. And for some, the war represents, even today, the beginning of nationhood. It illustrate, illustrates the strength of a nation in arms and the innate patriotism and loyalty of the Canadian people. But tonight, I want to tell another story, because I think this telling of the war is, at best, the stuff of myths, not reality. And when we consider how colonists responded to the call of arms in 1812 and their actions throughout the conflict, we really end up with quite a different picture. And this is a story that questions what it meant to be loyal, both before and during the War of 1812, 
For me, it's a really complex and intensely fascinating story, and one that's been largely overlooked by our present-day commemoration of the conflict, but one that continues to resonate today. It's a story of ambivalence and resistance and of divided loyalties. It's also one that highlights how our changing understanding of the past, and particularly of the War of 1812, continues to shape our understanding of the present. And so what I want to talk about today is a sort of a three-part event. The first I want to talk about is the colony before the war starts, what the col how colonists saw themselves, what the colony was like, and why, in fact, in 18, June of 1812, they, most people were really very reluctant to go to war. I then want to talk a little bit about how the experiences of war and of the conflict shaped residents' sense of themselves, and for them, during that, that period of conflict, what it meant to be loyal. And then I want to, if we've got time, very briefly talk about how memories of the war or how politicians used the war after, uh, used, me used memories of the war um, in the, the sort of in subsequent generations uh, influenced others' understandings of, of themselves and of what it meant to be a loyalist, loyal subject or citizen. And our story starts today, and this is part one, with the actual declaration of war in June of 1812 and why colonists were so reluctant. Now, it's been argued that many in the colony, in particular the Loyalists, were eager to avenge the British defeat against the American patriots during the Revolution. And you've got to remember, the Revolution was only a generation away in 1812, and many residents, not a majority, but many residents of Upper Canada had found themselves in 1774, 75, up to, seven, up to 1784, caught up in a conflict that had destroyed their property, had divided their families, and in some case, cases left the homeless and forced to flee for their lives. Loyalists were refugees. They were refugees as we would understand refugees today. But such memories of this war also convinced many that another war was not the answer. As Anne Powell, who was a resident of York at the time, a wife of the soon-to-be Chief Justice of the colony, and herself a loyalist, had written to her brother in 1810, she was very fearful about the threat of another North American conflict. She remembered the wholesale destruction and loss of life. Moreover, she wrote, the revolution had afforded many opportunities to the avaricious and unprincipled, and various unworthy characters made use of the general distress to amass immense wealth, i.e., she was talking about war profiteering, and she didn't want that to happen again. None of this, whether it was destruction or the profiteering, was an experience that even the loyalists wanted to repeat. But even those upper Canadians, and there were a growing number of them who could not remember or had been relatively untouched by the revolution, dreaded the coming of this one. They had family and friends south of the international border. This war for them was not only, quote, totally unnecessary, inexpedient, and impolitic, as the York paper said in 1811, it was also an unnatural war. It threatened to divide a people that since 1784 had lived together in peace and harmony. Now, why was this unnatural? And this is sort of the crux of what I want to come to. And the first thing, I think, is you've got to understand the nature of the population. We assume that Upper Canada is one of the two loyal provinces, right, created in 1791. One is New Brunswick, the other is Upper Canada. And there's no question, in 1790s, Upper Canada was one of the, quote, loyal provinces. But loyalists were also North Americans. Most of them had been born in the 13 colonies. Those who had not been born in the 13 colonies had actually migrated to the 13 colonies before the revolution because they were looking for more opportunities. When the, when, when the, rev the revolution had brought destruction and heartache, it had not, in fact, severed the bonds that tied many loyalists to friends and family who remained behind in the republic. Indeed, to many loyalists, home was still south of the international border and it was with this land and these people, not the rolling hills of the British Isles, with whom they identified. When seen in this light, it's not surprising that, as one traveler noted in 1794, the natural feelings, quote, of amity and personal friendship were revived very quickly, end quote, between those who had espoused republicanism and those who, in fact, had rejected it. Um, that sort of revival of amity meant that ardent loyalists like Richard Cartwright, Richard Cartwright was a young man, loyalist, uh, came to the Kingston, went to the Kingston area in 1776, 
77, I think, maybe 78, 78, I'm not sure, having really been kicked out of Albany. Um, but, and he becomes the principal merchant of Kingston until his death in 1815. By 1785, a year after the revolution, he's going back to Albany to visit, visit his father and his mother. And he continues to make trips regularly back and forth to Albany. And his father comes and joins him periodically in Kingston up until his father's death in 1809. Cartwright and others also sent their sons south to New York and to other, other centers in the New Republic to school. Cartwright's wife uh, periodically tri trips across the border to shop and to take the cure, which in fact was very, very popular at this point. And Cartwright and many loyalists welcomed lots and lots of visitors from south of the border. Now, such personal relationships were soon supplemented by increasingly lucrative economic associations. Within 10 years of the end of the revolution, Cartwright was supp supplying the American garrisons south of the Great Lakes with pork and flour, and was importing goods from the US for local residents in Upper Canada. American produce, including rum, fruit, tr fruit trees, and even some manufactured goods began to appear in colonial markets by 1797. And Upper Canadian farmers began to ship grain to American customers. As Cartwright and others appreciated, that uh, such trade that persisted up until and in fact throughout the War of 1812 was, quote, one of the most important sources of prosperity to the colony. Now, this orientation north and south, which is for people emotion, you know, sort of an emotional one as well as an economic one, initially um, was reinforced by the geographic realities of the colony. Poor and in many cases non existent roads isolated individual Upper Canadian communities from each other. Unless you were going by water, it was almost impossible, and certainly in the spring and fall was impossible to go over land between Kingston and Niagara, or Kingston and Montreal, or Kingston and York after York is formed. Um, for Upper Canadians, the easiest way into and out of the colony was across the lakes or across the river. And residents in New York and the New England states were Upper Canadians' closest and most accessible neighbors. Visitors, mail, news, and information from Europe, from the United States, and even from places like Halifax and St. John in eastern British North America traveled fastest and most efficiently and effectively to and from Upper Canada by way of New York or Boston or Philadelphia. Now, the traffic of goods peoples and ideas, north and south, uh, that had started very late, you know, soon after the end of the revolution, only increased after 1792, when a growing number of restless American settlers came north looking for land and new opportunities. These folks, who were often called the late loyalists, came at the invitation of the first lieutenant governor, John Gray Simcoe. Um, they had no attachment to the king, to Great Britain, and for most of them, they weren't even conscious of, in fact, the international border. They were, however, resourceful and capable farmers, just what imperial uh, officials thought the colony needed. Simcoe believed that once they got here, they were really loyalists, even if they hadn't known that they were loyalists during the American Revolution, and they would sort of see the light and everything would be fine. Now, what we know is that most of them don't see the light because there was no light for them as, as far as they uh, you know, were concerned to see. For them, they were just, in fact, going to take up land in another part of the American frontier. They were not, in fact, becoming members of the British Empire. Or, in fact, I mean, yes, they had to take an oath of allegiance, but, you know, if they were going to give me 100 acres of land, I'm quite willing to take an oath of allegiance, and why wouldn't I? You know, I mean, I've got no taxes here, and it's, it's going to cost me very little to do that. And so, and we do get, I mean, it's, it's interesting. What we know is that by 1810, those who are called loyalists are perhaps 10% of the population of Upper Canada. Probably 80% are these American settlers who are coming in. Some of them are coming in and then leaving again, because they're going off to the Ohio. But the population of Upper Canada by 1810 is predominantly American farmer, tradesmen and tradeswomen, uh, laborers who are looking for opportunities, uh, who are looking for, op for themselves and for their families. And for these folks, it made little difference whether they were living in the Republic or in Upper Canada, in the United States or, in or part of the British Empire. Now, what all residents, what in fact begins to happen then, 
is that these residents, most of whom are living along the St. Lawrence River, the Lower Great Lakes Basin, did know was that they increasingly they shared a, a sense of community that spanned the international border. The peoples of the regions played together and they worked together. They attended sporting events, and as soon as we get newspapers starting in 1797, we begin to get notices about horse races in Newark, or we get, uh, you know, that kind of thing going on. Um, they built, we know that they're going back and forth, they're bu building mills and harvesting together. And in 18, 1804, for example, Upper Canadians applauded when the American garrison at Niagara showed the colony's flag and pl played the British Grenadiers on the occasion of the King's birthday. And as the paper said, such acts of civility should be encouraged. Uh, only, he continued, by preserving harmony and promoting good neighborhood could friends of both nations respectively increase their national prosperity. Now, that's not to say there weren't problems in this, this sort of growing borderland community. Uh, and one of the problems was, of course, was that people were never sure where the border was. Um, and when you don't know where the border is, it meant that criminals who, we get lots of counterfeiting going on in Upper Canada and in upstate New York, uh, and if they were likely to get caught, they would sort of go across the border and then keep on going, and, and, people, and, and so they couldn't get caught. Uh, people would break out of jail and, and whip across the St. Lawrence River. Uh, huge debates and, um, what, what's the word I want, um, spectacles uh, about Brit British soldiers in particular who would desert. Uh, and British soldiers would desert and go whipping from Kingston in particular. Kingston folks were really incensed by this. They'd go whipping across the border uh, and basically thumb their nose at the British authorities. The, the Americans are actually enticing them because they're offering them more money um, as a salary. But you get this kind of tension periodically going on. The biggest area of tension and at the same time community was smuggling. Smuggling was a very, very lucrative, perhaps not respectable, but accepted way of life along this border, as many of us might think it still is. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't been to the States in a long time, but I know that when I go, I don't always declare everything. Um, it actually got, gets to the point, though, of creating serious problems. There is an international incident uh, in 1809 when one of the customs officers in Sackets Harbor, just the, the, uh, on the other side of St. Lawrence, um, talked about all the force I can rage, rage is not sufficient to stop them. The smugglers were determined to evade um, the force that he had. He had two other men to help him at the risk of their lives. And he concluded fearfully, my life and the lives of my deputies are threatened daily. What will be the fate of us, God only knows. Uh, and you begin to get these reports emerging. The problem was that there was little he or other community leaders could do to stop enterprising borderland residents. Now, Leaders in Upper Canada appreciated the difficulties and apparent contradictions of their situation in the years before the outbreak of the war. Upper Canada was, after all, a British colony. It had been created as an asylum for loyalist refugees. Uh, it had British laws. It had the British constitution, or at least a variant of it. Uh, and people should expect, you know, people had to go out for the militia once a year. Uh, they celebrated, they got sort of the equivalent of a holiday for the king's birthday. This was officially a British colony. But it was a British colony peopled by American residents. And it was situated on the shoulders of an expanding, and it was believed, by the leaders at least, of an increasingly aggressive Republican gi giant. And all the individuals tried to resolve, ensure that local dif difficulties, like people whipping across back and forth, back and forth across the border to avoid uh, detection, that arose because of this undefined border were resolved, this did not ensure peace between the governments of the United States and Great Britain. Tensions had erupted in 1794, um, and people were much relieved when they received news about the successful negotiation of the Jays Treaty at that point. In 1800, Upper Canadians, and we begin to get this sort of growing concern by leaders, watched as American neutrality was buffeted by the combined pressure of war in Europe and internal political divisions. Thomas Jefferson's victory in 1801 brought renewed fears that the United States would join France in its campaign against Great Britain. And although such fears appeared for a time to be unfounded, that what's called the Chesapeake Affair, when a British ship actually uh, uh, shot and boarded uh, an American ship to 
retrieve what they considered were deserting sailors, what Americans considered were American citizens, lots of hoo-ha, actually an international incident uh, that goes on. Uh, there were threats that, in fact, war was imminent. Uh, people did expect that war was imminent. Now, what's interesting is, so you had these upper Canadian leaders, uh, some of them, John Strong's not one of them yet, but uh, William Dummer Powell here in Kingston, uh, Francis Gore, who's the lieutenant governor, Richard Cartwright, who's sitting in, in Kingston, um, all concerned about this. But when they try to figure out why the situation is, particularly in the United States, so what they consider fraught and, and unruly, um, they actually turn to information they get from American friends and American associates to explain what's going on. And for some time, many colonists actually had begun, and we get, begin to get this very soon after Jefferson's election, they talked about good Americans and bad Americans. Every upper Canadian knew that there were good Americans. Good Americans were the Federalists. They were the folks who, Washington wasn't really a good American, but he was close to being a good American but John Adams was a good American. These are folks who believed in an organic society. They believed in the need for order. They believed in the need for trade with Great Britain in particular. Uh, they believed in the need that some people were born to rule and most were not. And those of us who were not should in fact just do what we were told and work hard. Bad Americans were the Democrats, the Republicans, those who believed in what, what Upper Canadians said was party rule, they were people like Thomas Jefferson and in 1812, President Madison. They were the folks who were threatening stability in North America. And so it's interesting because upper Canadian leaders, when they're, remember, they're, they're getting their news from south of the border, that news is coming from Federalist newspapers. That news is coming from Federalist associates. That news is, and understand the upper Canadians' understandings of what's coming, going on is coming from Federalists who are saying, do you see what Jefferson has done now? Do you understand what he's doing? And so that in 1807, when we actually do have a major war scare, upper Canadian leader, leaders find themselves in a position where they've got this American population who they have no idea what they're going to do if war breaks out. And at the same time, they believe that most of the United States don't want war, but they want to maintain this British colony. And so what they do is they begin to craft a sort of propaganda campaign that I think they actually believed. I'm not, I mean, for us it looks like propaganda campaign, but I think some of these folks believed that this is what was going on. Um, and so as they try and convince upper Canadians that if war happens, you should come out and fight, they do this by turning around and saying, if you come out and fight for the king, you're also fighting for good Americans who are also your friends and your associates, right? You're fighting against the forces. And I want to give you an example of that. And this comes in a speech that was given in December of 1807 by Richard Cartwright, who was a colonel of the militia in Kingston. He's got an assembled men in front of him, and he's trying to convince them that with war comes, you guys better come out. And he turns around and he says, it was the American government and the Republicans, quote, that blind and misguided party, those who advocated despotism and anarchy, who were threatening to plunge the continent into war. Cartwright continued, quote, the most enlightened and patriotic citizens of the United States, he's referring to the Federalists, realized that war would harm American co co commerce, excuse me, and ultimately the existence of their independence. Colonists knew, he said, that the U.S. Congress was divided over the issue of war, and they were. And one congressman, he said, was reported to have, quote, written to the president that we are doing no good. I fear we are about to plunge the nation into war and the most dreadful calamities unnecessarily and wantonly. Thus, and so here we begin to get Cartwright turning around and explaining to folks what the nub of all this. If the worst happened and war was declared, colonists should obviously defend themselves, but in the process, he intimates, they would also be defending the interests of many friends and neighbors in the United States. And so loyalty becomes this very interesting who are you loyal to, and how do you then express it? And for the next four years, as Upper Canada, and we get this, Upper Canadians, I think, begin to believe they, they were living on a precipice between 1807 with the Chesapeake Affair and when war finally breaks out in June of, eight, of 1812. Uh, um, and the, the colonial leaders are aware of this. I mean, we get war scares in 1807, we get an embargo in 1808-09, everybody wins with the embargo because of the smuggling that goes back and forth across the border, 
that nobody can stop. Looks like everything's going to be okay in 1810. Then in 1811, we get another war scare. And then the end of 1811, maybe it's not going to happen. And then in January of 1812, things begin to ramp up. And they really ramp up by then. And the rhetoric ramps up around it. American rhetoric ramps up. British rhetoric ramps up. Colonial leaders here in York begin to ramp up the rhetoric, as you'll see. But you've still got to convince this population what loyalty means and who you fight for. And so for in those four or five years, upper Canadian leaders waged a pointed and increasingly assertive campaign to try to convince their readers that if war broke out, settlers could and should defend their new homes against the forces of tyranny and republicanism. By doing so, it was explicitly stated they would be remaining true or loyal to their old homes and beliefs. The rhetoric of the campaign explicitly linked the republicans with the despot Napoleon. Jefferson became Napoleon, it was used again and again, and characterized the Republicans as, quote, cunning pretenders to liberty and equality. They were corrupt and venal speculators, the avowed patrons of slavery and dealers in human blood. Again and again, public pronouncements did not deny the patriotism or courage of the American people because they clearly were patriotic. And it, everybody knew in Upper Canada it was said that the best men in that nation Men of the greatest talents, courage, and wealth were opposed to war. Only the most worthless part of the population, the refuse and scum of the earth, renegades and vagabonds, savages of the worst description, would take up arms against upper Canadians. The colonists, their leaders asserted time and again, must take warning from the misfortunes of their federalist friends and ensure the survival of their homes as part of the British Empire. And so it's a very interesting and really, I think, quite skillful campaign to try to convince a population where loyalty really is divided. And I think for most people, they actually didn't care. They just wanted to stay out of it anyway. Uh, but for those that you really are not sure what they're going to do, you've got to convince them that if you fight here, you're really fighting for them as well, even though they may be part of the enemy. I mean, it's a lovely campaign that works on that. The success, however, of this campaign, I think, was mixed. And although international tensions continued to threaten local peace, residents certainly continued to move back and forth across the border to till their fields, to trade, to shop, whether it was in New York or in New York, or in trade. Even in January and February of 1812, when Isaac Brock warned that although we wish and hope for peace, war was probably at no great distance and it was Upper Canadian's duty to prepare, be prepared, most turned a deaf ear. Members of the House of Assembly refused to pass measures to require militiamen to swear oath of allegiance because they didn't think militiamen would swear an oath of allegiance. Interesting. Um, Brock's uh, request to suspend the writ of habeas corpus was denied. As George Shepard, who's commented in his book, Plunder, Profits, and Paroles, the colonists were firm in their belief that they were not responsible for the deteriorating relationship with Britain and the United States. And as one colonist suggested in a letter that appeared in the Upper Canada Gazette, if your, meaning the United States, quarrel is with Britain, go and avenge yourself on her shores, not ours. Even when Stephen Miles of Kingston Gazette announced that war had been declared, life continued much as usual for most Upper Canadians. Individuals, goods, and news continued to flow across the border, and many continued to hope that outright conflict could be avoided. And in fact, they were giving lots of advice in June and July. You know, don't fight unless you're, unless sort of, don't, don't, don't be the one to strike the first blow. Uh, if you can, get out of the way, all of that kind of, I mean, it's really quite lovely, the, the advice people get. As George Shepard again observed, all colonists' indifference to the war was striking, and this indifference was not restricted only to those most recent arrivals to the United States. It included the loyalists, the late loyalists, farmers, craftsmen, and politicians all tried to avoid service. Now, that's sort of the end of part one, and this gives you some sense of whether in June of 1812 we can talk about bold Canadian boys who were later extolled in song and in myth. This is to not suggest, I think, that Upper Canadians were disloyal before the war, but the question arises as loyal to who or to what. For most, I think it was to their local community that often included friends and family in the United States. It was loyalty to the land and the borderland community that for many had become their home. 
loyalty to some abstraction, to some government, was for most too far removed from their everyday lives. Colonial authorities, I think, were aware of this as they developed their propaganda campaigns. And in fact, they used this kind of thing throughout the war, and both military commanders and civilian officials continued to emphasize from 1812 right through until the end of 1814 that upper Canadians needed to fight in defense of those under siege at home in New England and New York, um, as much as for their new homes in Upper Canada. The enemy was the banditi, the rapists and the worst elements of American society. Thus, if colonial men, brave Christian soldiers, sorry, <coughs> did not take up arms, all that was near and dear to their hearts, including family in the United States, would be destroyed by a merciless foe. Now, and I think even when actual conflict erupts, um, it, it did little to convince the majority of Upper Canadians of the justness of the war or of the need to support British forces. Certainly, and I don't think there's any question, many men could not avoid becoming, and some eagerly joined the cause. And a number of men not only fought beside British soldiers, but many of them were wounded and killed. But on the whole, <laughs> the war was, to say the least, not very popular. And the very nature of the war did little to promote a sense of loyalty to the Britain or to the empire. Rather, it only confirmed that loyalty was contingent on particular circumstances and events. The proud Canadian boys were going to have to wait until after the conflict was over. And I want to briefly remind you about the nature of this war. Um, this was a war where the home front was, in many cases, the battlefront. Particularly in the western portion of Upper Canada, but also periodically here in York, residents lived in the midst of battles and often in occupied territory, where soldiers of both armies were camped in their fields, walked or marched down their village streets, and military officers tried to ensure that civilian population was docile and supportive. Loyalty then during war, wartime in this kind of war was a very difficult concept, and particularly for non-combatants caught in the midst of a battlefield. Loyalty as it's traditionally understood, you know, hand over your heart, yes, I will support the troops, as we all have been doing quite rightly in, in Afghanistan or wherever it happens to be, is a very different thing than loyalty when, in fact, your home has been taken over by various troops, when they're taking, your fo taking food from your, your barns, when, in fact, they're taking down your barn. Uh, that's a very different kind of loyalty. That's a very different concept, I think, and demands different things of loyalty. Um, often, I think that kind of loyalty has to be balanced with the needs of family, uh, with the needs to make ends meet, and in fact, with seizing opportunities. And I just want to just sort of touch on a few of these to give you some idea of, I think, how we want to think about loyalty or disloyalty uh, in this kind of cir cir circumstance. Um, there is no question that in this war, we actually have civilians who were frequently became victims during what was often a brutal and intimate conflict. The home front included many who had little means to protect themselves, and many lost their homes, their livelihoods, and family members. But many Upper Canadians had choices, and many of those who were the non-combatants actually exercised those choices. And so for women and children who were expected to be the ones protected on the home front, who often found themselves unable to be protected on their home front, um, they made choices like, in fact, following the forces uh, into the field, becoming camp followers. Uh, we have militiamen, wives, and, and in fact, daughters who cooked and tended wounds, provided sustenance, and washed clothes. Civilian women, too, continued, contributed directly and indirectly to the cause, and for a number, the war offered excitement and new opportunities, as well as anxiety. Because in many cases, these women are actually, it's, it, it, it seems to be a sort of loyalty or at least sense of community that comes with family and with community. What we know is that in many cases, some women were going out to help neighbors who were there, not as some abstraction that was going on, I'm going to go and help the British forces. More often, however, civilians carried on as best they could, quote, at home, wherever at home was while the war, war, war swirled around them. One of the expectations of those left at home was that they would keep things going while the men were away. 
But to carry on a family business in Upper Canada, whether it's farming or running a shop, without the assistance of husbands or son, sons or even hired uh, workers, uh, was, to say the, to, was to say the least difficult. Farming was hard work, and no one, man or woman, could do it on their own. So when men were away, it often meant that crops were not sown or harvested, families had little to sell at local markets, and many had to rely on charity or the help of friends and neighbors. It was not surprising that many men, well aware of the situation at home, just walked away from the war. They were already, as one said, hungry, cold, fearful of becoming sick or injured, and the needs of their families, loyalty to their families, often took precedent over the duty to the king and country. And as late as 1814, one avid loyalist, Joel Stone, if you don't know anything about Joel Stone, go and read about Joel Stone. He's really an interesting character from the Brockville area. He's a bit of a renegade, but I mean, just anyway, I, I won't get into it. Joel Stone, but he, he is one of the avid loyalists who was just eager to go after the Americans at the same time that his son, in fact, was living with his sister who lived in Albany, New York. Um, he's exasperated by the indifference of the local population to the war and what he saw as the insubordination of his men. And they were, he reported to um, a friend, the, the, being influenced by, quote, the elderly persons in the country and mothers in particular, who had, by their examples and bad counsel, point, uh, uh, point, point, um, poisoned the minds of the youth and indulged their passive behavior. Instead of instilling in their sons respect, deference, and loyalty to authority and an eagerness to fight for king and country, it seems that many women believed that the immediate needs of families and of the farms took priority, particularly in a war that was not of their own making. And so we're beginning to see this sort of loyalty to who and to what. Now, not all farm, houses fa farm households faced such difficulty, and armies needed to be provisioned. They needed food, the beasts needed food, and all of that kind of th sort of thing. By 1813, both sides, American and British, are very hard pressed to maintain their men in the fields, let alone when they were in garrison. And initially, British and American forces offered to purchase what they needed. Cash was difficult to come by, however, and the British at least paid for most of their goods with army script. Uh, the problem was that many farmers very quickly began to resist, in fact, taking script and selling goods to the army. And the reason was that they found that British authorities either would not honor the script, or they honored only part of the script, or they said to them, come back at the end of the war, and then we will honor the script, um, and everything will be fine. Um, that there also were considerable differentials in prices for goods, and so that people began to realize that if I just hold back a little bit of my goods, I can get a higher price in two months than I'm getting now, and if I can afford to and hold back even a little bit more, I can get much more. And if I can get it somehow to Kingston, I'm going to get more in Kingston than I'm going to get in Niagara. And so why wouldn't I? Now, many would argue from the outside that that's disloyalty. But at the same time, these are farmers who will find themselves uh, where they've got um, situations where uh, soldiers are in their fields and destroying their fields. They are taking their, their uh, vegetables. Uh, as one um, young officer said, he had a, was telling his father about something called the Grand Attack on the Onions where, in fact, the local farmer had been upset about, had refused, in fact, to provide the, his, his troop with uh, the, arm, the soldiers with uh, food. And so the soldiers engaged in a whole series of petty plundering, uh, which included a grand attack on the onions. Uh, it included killing a, uh, the, the uh, various turkeys, uh, and in the end, taking down all the fences of the farmer, um, who later we discover, if you go to the claims, actually puts in a claim for this incident itself. Not surprisingly, Upper Canadians begin to resent British authorities. They also begin to resent American authorities because there is wholesale destruction that goes on. And so we begin to get, and I think it's evident by the end of 1813, uh, and perhaps even earlier than that, a real tension between civilian and military forces. This is not a good way, as you know, as all of you know who, who've done any military history, um, forces who are armies of occupation, which is in fact what these folks were, um, are, are often not uh, welcomed in areas. And so loyalty becomes a very difficult situation uh, in this kind of, um, very difficult to, to actually even imagine in this kind of situation. We have all sorts of examples of those kinds of tensions 
At the same time that we have examples of men who willingly go off to war, we also have men who refuse to go off to war. We also have stories of women who are willing to um, do washing for first the American army, and then the British army, and then the American army. Well, if you have no food on the table, you have to, in fact, we don't know why they do it, other than, I mean, they actually were making, apparently, a relatively good, good salary or, or a good sum of money. But we actually don't know the circumstances, but if, in fact, that's how it happens to be there as part of the, uh, uh, part of the occupation, it's not surprising that you would take advantage of it. So the question of loyalty becomes, in fact, very contingent and it's very divided. And by the end of the war, we also know that we get tremendous divisions between wealthy, those who are war profiteers, and we know we have some really significant war profiteering going on during this War of 1812, and those who are destitute and on the streets. We know that there are differences between the western section of the colony and the eastern section of the colony, which has almost no property damage uh, and very relatively little loss of life. And we get resentments growing between one and another. And the question of loyalty then becomes even more complicated. So the question becomes, what does loyalty and identity mean at the end of the war? Particularly when at the end of the war we begin to get reports as soon as war is over, and Kingston will go back to Stephen Miles again in the Kingston Gazette, who turns around and says, and let me just make sure that I've got this right, um, who talks about, um, here I am, that with, with, with exceeding great joy, that merciful, merciful providence had granted the blessings of peace with, quote, so little sacrificing. And for some, that was certainly the case. For others, it is not. And the story becomes more complicated because two weeks later in Kingston, army officers from the American garrison south of the Great Lakes are entertained by British officers for dinner and a formal event in Kingston itself. And it becomes, in fact, things seem to go back to normal and to where it's going. At the same time, we know we have wholesale devastation in parts of the colony. We also have people who can't, widows who, who can't, through their war claims, get their damages um, compensated. We, in fact, also have situations where the War of 1812, and we have a loyal and patriotic society, which goes, which refuses in some cases to be, be providing compensation to some while it's providing compensation to others. And so what we've got is a war where loyalty and identity are not the brave Canadian boys who in fact take down the Yankees in Detroit. And yet that's the memory that we have now of the war, or some of us have now of the war. How many of you have actually looked at the government website, federal government website? Anybody looked at it? I've been following it for the last two years. And um, <clears throat> I think there's, uh, there's some difficulties. Um, and as one of my colleagues who, who teaches at McGill said, and there's not one French Canadian in the lot, and we were there, <laughs> damn it. Um, but it is, I was looking at it just as I was leaving RMC. And I was looking at it because it, it, it actually talked about this proud military heritage, this, the Canadian military heritage that goes back to the War of 1812. And I was writing a new introduction for this thing, The Lion, the Eagle, in Upper Canada. And I knew that this does not go back to a proud Canadian heritage um, of the War of 1812. It's a, it's a good British heritage, sort of. Um, it's a war, however, that for Canadians to claim as their own at the same time that we do have these kind of stories. And I'm not making all of this up. In fact, I'm not making any of it up. Um, it is a very different sense of what the nation is and how we build nations. And yet, and I want to leave you, and I'm probably going on for far too long, I'll just give you, I want to explain, talk a little bit about how we get from the stories that I tell about the War of 1812 to the stories that are now being told on government websites about the War of 1812. And I think it comes, and it happens very quickly after the war. By uh, 1816, John Strawn, all of you know John Strawn, soon to be the venerated John Strawn, talks about the legacy of the Loyalists in the War of 1812. The War of 1812, he says in 1816, is clearly a great Loyalist victory. It is a victory of loyal Upper Canadians who, in fact, have put down Republicans and Republicanism um, and have ensured the health and vibrancy of Upper Canada and the British Empire. Um, John Strong was a very good politician. There is no question about it. He was really, really a good politician. And he and his cohort, this group who eventually we're going to recognize as the Tories, for them, the Loyalist legacy in the War of 1812 is very important. 
Now, it's interesting because it's very important, but at the same time, we begin to get um, debates about, and it comes up, for example, in 1828, we have a bill called the Alien Bill. Who has the right to call themselves an Upper Canadian? Those who are British subjects have the right to call themselves Upper Canadian. And here they're not quite sure what to do with the War of 1812 because they have American citizens, or at least Americans who fought in the Revolution, who then fought on the Upper Canadian side in the War of 1812. And are they British subjects or are they not British subjects? And should they be British subjects and should they be able to have land? It became very complicated. And it's at that point that loyalism and the War of 1812, however, solidifies around this idea of being British, being orderly, and being really um, the nub of this new sort of almost racial group that emerges. Those ideas continue, and they appear again around the time of Confederation uh, with the writing of people like Edgerton Ryerson, who writes a history of Upper Canada, uh, with groups called the Canada Firsters, who right after Confederation talk about uh, the Loyalists in the War of 1812 being pivots of this new Canadian nationalism, good Aryan boys who'd gone out and, and defeated the southern weak Yankees. I mean, the rhetoric then is quite different kind of rhetoric, but it's a, it resonates in all of that. What's for me quite fascinating is the 1960s, some of that is then resurrected, uh, where we get loyalist War of 1812 and anti-Americanism get linked. Uh, in the 1960s, we begin to get this sort of George Grant emergence of a sort of new national idea. Uh, and one of those ideas is that uh, Canada is built on something called the Tory touch. And the Tory touch is what the loyalists arrived with, with their good British heritage. Um, they, were, they clearly were not Americans. They were the best of the Americans who came up after the revolution. They won the War of 1812, and they set in place this great peace, order, and good government that we have here. Um, that actually became very much part of the sort of litany and a public sort of conversation that went around it. Um, and I think that is actually being resurrected again today. And so that's why we have, and we can, and people talk about these bold Canadian boys who did, who down at Detroit town did Yankees they take down. But for me, that's the story of myth. That's not the story of reality but it's not the story of loyalties as we would understand them today, where they seem to be very clear cut. I think they're the st st story of loyalties of people trying to cope in a very complicated and complex world where in fact governments, whether it's American, British, Republican, monarchy, have not the kind of resonance, particularly when you've got soldiers on the ground and in your backyard. Thank you very much. I hope that makes sense.